What's going on, my fellow mathematicians? We are back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of translating the couple pendula problem into a standard eigenvalue problem. Specifically, we're going to continue with steps three and four. We spent a lot of time setting up the structure of this transformation. We're going to do an analysis of system forces on each mass using free body diagrams in the first part of this video. And then we're going to show how we can use that analysis to set up the coupled differential equation governing the coupled pendulum problem. As soon as we finish with that, we'll be ready to move on and translate this problem into a standard eigenvalue problem. Let's begin with step three, where we're going to draw a free body diagram for each mass. We'll start with the left mass M1. If we're going to be super formal about it, we're going to look at the actual forces on that mass, and those consist of the tension force in the cord, the force pulling the mass to the right, which is the spring force. Once I connect that spring, the spring is going to kind of pull the mass towards mass two, mass one towards mass two. And then we have the force of gravity going down. Remember though that we are orthogonally decomposed the force of gravity into a component that it's in the same direction as the tension force, but opposite orientation. And specifically, these two forces cancel out. And then we did the orthogonal component that was tangential to the arc shaped curve. Moreover, we approximated that orthogonal component, the one that's tangent to the arc shaped curve, in the direction of u. So we kind of reoriented it to think about the bob motion linearly locally around zero by assuming that the small angle approximation held. When we do that, the tension force and the component of gravity in that direction disappear, and we're left only with the force of the spring pulling to the right and the force of the pendulum pulling to the left, which means in our free body diagram, we have mass one in the center, the spring force pulls to the right, the pendulum force on pendulum one pulls to the left, and then we can say that the sum of forces on mass one, that's a scalar quantity since each of these are in scalar form, is going to be the pendulum force on pendulum one plus the spring force on mass one. In previous videos, we saw that this pendulum force was actually linearized as negative m1 times g divided by L times the displacement. Similarly, in the last video, we saw that the spring force was going to be the spring constant times the change in length of the spring from equilibrium, or another way to say that, the spring constant times the elongation. Here is the elongation. When we're looking at the net force, we can actually do this in terms of U1 and U2. The reason we call this coupled is the motion of U1 and U2 is now dependent on each other. That's the whole reason that we say the spring couples this motion together. Here, we could actually group, if we distributed the K, so this would be K times U2 minus K times U1, we could bring the K times U1 over to this term and then factor out a U1, and we would get the net force acting on mass one is gonna be negative M1 times G divided by L minus K times U1, and then we have this term left over plus k times u2. This is a representation of the net force acting on mass one under the assumption that the pendulum force acts in the same horizontal motion as the spring force does. Now for some of you astute viewers, yes, we are assuming that the spring never tilts. In reality, as the pendulums go up and down, that spring is going to tilt a little bit, but we're literally linearizing it. So not only are we assuming that the pendulum stays local, aka goes along the u-axis, we're also assuming that the spring is always straight and there's no kind of shift in the spring force based on that tilting. Just as we looked at our free body diagram for mass one, let's take a look at a free body diagram for mass two. The same idea, if we were looking formally at the actual forces in the system, we would say that mass two has a tension force in the cord. It has the spring force pulling in the opposite direction now. The spring force on mass one was pulling towards mass two. The spring force on mass two is pulling towards mass one. And then we have the force of gravity pulling downwards in the vertical direction. Once again, we decompose that force of gravity 
in the same direction as the tension force, a component of that, and then also an orthogonal component in the tangential axis to the arc-shaped path. We then linearized that thing and said, hey, instead of having that tangential component be a function of theta, let's imagine that it's directly along the U axis. The tension force and the component of gravity in that direction cancel out. This tangential force is approximated by the horizontal pendulum force in the u-axis and we say that the net force acting on the second mass in our system is now the pendulum force in the u-axis on mass 2 or the effect of pendulum 2 and then the opposite of the spring force on mass 1 well that's negative f sub s of t so when i look at the net force acting on mass 2 that net force is going to be the pendulum force on mass 2 in the direction of the u-axis plus the negative spring force, we're assuming that the spring force is written in terms of positive directions going to the right. In this situation, we saw in a previous video that we can quantify the pendulum force as negative m2 times g divided by l multiplied by the displacement of mass 2. So that's the effect of the pendulum motion on mass 2. The magnitude of the spring force was k times the elongation of the spring or the change of length we saw in a previous video that's going to be k times u2 minus u1 here we're orienting that force in the opposite direction as we did in mass one so that's where the negative comes from we could distribute the negative k so i bring the negative k to u2 i also bring a copy of negative k to negative u1 and i see negative times negative becomes a positive and in fact i only have one term of u1 so this is positive k u1 plus then i have negative k u2 plus this term times u2 i can factor out the u2 and i'm left with negative k minus m2 times g divided by l quantity multiplied by u2 but anytime we have an expression that allows us to calculate net force a small angel pops up on one of our shoulders and says newton's second law at least i hope that's an angel and not the other one in any case, we remember that Newton's second law says that the sum of forces acting on a mass is equal to the mass times the acceleration. This time, we're going to state this law using vectors rather than scalars. So instead of thinking about each individual mass as a single component, we're going to look at the behavior of this law in terms of the entire system and encode the information in vector form. In this case, we'll start with the right-hand side, mass times acceleration. Remember, we have this couple pendulum system. We have mass one on the left. We have mass two on the right. We're looking at the behavior of the masses, the location of the masses along the u-axis. In other words, we've linearized our system. And we're going to say that when we're looking at the sum of all forces in each mass, that's going to be the mass itself times the second derivative of that displacement. So when I write that in terms of a vector, the net force acting on mass 1 is going to be mass 1 times the second derivative of the displacement of mass 1 along the u-axis. Same thing for the sum of forces acting on mass 2. That's going to be mass 2 times the acceleration of mass 2 in terms of the displacement function. But this quantity right here can be rewritten using matrix vector multiplication. Specifically, we have a diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements have the appropriate masses. So m1, 0 times u1 double dot, u2 double dot, m1 goes to the first, 0 goes to the second. Indeed, I get that first term. Second term, 0. m2 times u double dot, I get the second term. And what that means is I can express my sum of forces on each component of the system, on each mass of the system, as a single mass matrix multiplied by the second derivative of a displacement function. But the displacement function is actually a uh, vector valued output. So in particular, I say that u of t has in coordinate 1 the function u1 of t and in coordinate 2 the function u2 of t. That takes care of the right hand side. Now we're going to pass the focus to the left hand side. Specifically, when we're looking at the sum of all forces, 
not only do we know that's the mass times acceleration, but we've just seen through our free body diagram that we can express the sum of forces on mass one using this quantity. We did that a few minutes ago in this video. And the sum of forces on mass two using this quantity. Moreover, we can rewrite these individual scalars as a matrix vector multiplication. Specifically, notice that I have some scalar times u1 plus another scalar times u2. In the second entry, I have some scalar times u1 plus another scalar times u2. That's exactly this matrix multiplication. Here, m1 times g divided by l minus k times u1, that gives me the first scalar, across row 1, positive k times u2, that gives me the second scalar. In matrix multiplication, when I go across a row and down a column, I add the corresponding products. In the second row, I go across the row, down the column, and I get the second scalar, which means now I've written the sum of the forces as a matrix times my displacement vector. Here's where we're going to do a little algebraic magic. We can actually factor out a negative sign here, and you, you might ask, why do we do that? Give me a second, you'll see why in a second. Pull out a negative of the first one, pull out a negative second, third, and fourth. So that means that the first becomes all positive, the entry 1, 2 becomes a negative, entry 2, 1 becomes a negative, entry 2, 2 becomes a positive. And then I can call this matrix my matrix K. In previous linear algebra lectures, I would call this the stiffness matrix. But specifically what we see is that the sum of all forces acting on each individual component when written as a vector is negative K times the displacement. However, now we have not only that we can express the sum of forces on each individual mass as equal to negative k times the displacement vector, we also know that the sum of all forces on each mass is the mass matrix times the second derivative of the displacement vector. But this leads to a matrix versions of Newton's second law. Here is the sum of all forces written as negative stiffness matrix times the displacement. That was this one from earlier in this video. Over here, we've got each individual mass times each individual second derivative or acceleration. And when we think about this matrix version of Newton's second law, in other words, Newton's second law written for each individual mass in our system and then organized using matrices and vectors, we could bring this negative K over to the right hand side. And that's why I factored out the negative. This thing right here is very, very famous in mathematics. This is a second order, undamped, unforced, simple harmonic oscillator equation. If you've taken an ordinary differential equations class, you likely might have studied this. The difference between this one and the one you see in a normal introduction to differential equations is this is a matrix version of that. This differential equation actually discusses a multi-component system. So there's actually information not only about mass one, but also mass two in matrix vector form here. Now, of course, if we wanted to be too legit, too legit to quit, we probably should say M is the diagonal matrix with the masses on the diagonals. U of t is a vector valued function that takes in time and produces individual components to be the individual displacements for each mass. So again, that's the measurement of the shadow of each pendulum along the ruler. And then the stiffness matrix K is given by this, where M is a measured scalar, M1 is a measured scalar, M2 is a measured scalar, we usually could use a scale for that. L is the length of the pendulum, K is the stiffness of the spring, and then g is the acceleration due to gravity. In other words, these are experimental constants having to do with the actual components in our system. With that, we're almost ready to turn this into a standard eigenvalue problem. Pretty good stuff. I do want to say, do you know when mathematicians say given a matrix? Well, I could have avoided the hours of lecture and tens of hours of work that I've done and just given you these matrices to begin with. But that's my point. If we're ever going to learn to use linear algebra, we actually have to learn to construct matrices from the world around us. And that's why I say I refuse to use the word given. One of the ways I judge myself as a teacher is, can I help you find matrices and then apply this theory for yourself? Even better, can I get you paid to do that? In the next video, we'll translate this structure into a standard eigenvalue problem. I'll see you in the next video.